All right, so first thing I'm going to do is just go over the basic. You learned this in uh, AMP, general AMP, right? I'm just going to go over the basic structure of the urinary system, yeah? You know that you got uh, two kidneys. You only need one, right? So there's a redundancy um, in the system. Back in the day, we used to eat kind of bad stuff, you know, before we had processed food. So you needed the kidney to get rid of some of those uh, toxins. Now we just eat really good stuff, right? All natural, right? And then you have some daddy pops every once in a while, which, I mean, who could blame you? <laughs> Ready? Okay, look, the right kidney is slightly smaller and a little lower than the left. And why would that be? Is this a man or a woman? It's a woman. So the reason the right kidney is lower than the left is when this woman was modeling for it, she wasn't really into it. She's like, <laughs> so the kidney went. <laughs> I, I hate me too. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, um, the liver's here, right? You don't have a liver on the... Left side. What do you got on the left side? It's for right about here. No, the pancreas is over is over here. What do you got? I heard it. That's a spleen. That's why. Okay. All right, that was exciting. All right. So watch. The primary function of the kidney is to filter the plasma of the blood. Listen, I'm going to say that real slow. The primary function of the kidney is to filter the plasma of the blood. Plasma of the blood. And the kidney, you better write this down, better not pout, does three things. When it makes urine, it filters the plasma. Then, what was filtered, what the body needs, the kidney will reabsorb back into the blood. And then some things have a difficult time actually being filtered by the kidney. So they have to be actively secreted. And I'm just going to tell you this. The two things that have to be actively secreted, actually three things, are hydrogen ions, potassium ions, and our buddy, our pal, creatinine. Now, and this, again, we talked about this. When an organ fails, all the functions of that organ fail. So many of the things that the kidney does kind of are behind the scenes. You don't even know they're happening, but when your kidneys are failing, all hell kind of breaks loose. It's really bad. But you got hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis or kidney transplants. But if your kidneys are going bad, that's bad for you. See, you're following that so far, right? Okay, so once the kidney filters the plasma, what is filtered will then travel through these hollow muscular tubes called ureters. And know this, the ureters actually come in at the bottom of the bladder, and the urine kind of bubbles up into the bladder, right? You can sometimes hear it bubbling. If you were close enough, you could hear my urine bubbling. Um, now, again, the bladder, by definition, is a hollow muscular organ. And what are the two things that muscle can do? Relax and contract, right? So you, you're not going to believe this. The bladder has, inside the smooth muscle that makes it up, uh-oh, baroreceptors. They have these pressure receptors. And as urine fills up the bladder, the pressure increases, and that initiates the micturation reflex. So if you have to go to the bathroom, you can now start using these big words. Like, hey, 
I gotta go to the micturation station. I hate meat too. Okay. Now, a couple of things clinically. This is where we're gonna see Kenny. Here's Kenny. Oh fuck. Okay. Watch. Listen up, cause this is true. A hollow, I'm not a hollow, a circular band of muscle that separates body parts is called a sphincter. And the bladder has an internal sphincter that is under weight, that's under autonomic control. And then you have an external sphincter, which is under conscious control, right? So if your bladder starts filling up during class, it would not be polite to just start whizzing. You got me? So what you do is, now watch, when your bladder hits a critical pressure, that internal sphincter, which is under autonomic control, is going to relax. But what do you do? You tighten up your external sphincter. You're like, hey, right? And you hold that until it's time to go. And then you relax that external sphincter, and boom, you pee. Say, yeah. Now, watch. When someone has a spinal cord injury, if they're a paraplegic or a quadriplegic, can they pee on their own? No. So if you're a quadriplegic, you have to have a urinary catheter, a Foley catheter, where it continually drains urine, right? Because that internal sphincter is going to be contracted and they can't relax their external sphincter so they can't go on their own. What a paraplegic does, the same thing is, but they have the use of their arms so they will cat themselves every couple of hours, self-cat. Say, yeah. All right. Can I tell you a story? Yeah or no? Yeah. Anyways, uh, I took care of this guy. He was a quadriplegic. He wasn't on a ventilator. So his injury was below what? His injury was below C5, right? And above T1. Anyways, he jumped into a pond. He didn't know how deep it was. Jumped head first, boom, right? Young guy. Anyways, he was like, uh, uh, when I met him, he was about 32. So every month we would have to change his Foley catheter, right? So he would say to me, Tim, when you pull the old one out, can you come back in like an hour and put the new one in? And I said, absolutely. Do you understand? Right? The other female nurses would never do that for me. Oh, well, there's too much of an infection, risk of infection. I'm like, for real? Now watch, mentally, this guy is still 32 years old. Physically, his body is useless. Just so you know, a male erection is reflexive most days. <laughs> Tell me you got that. So what he would do, and I, I said, I don't want to know. I'll just come back in an hour. And I think what he did is he paid the aide some extra money to <laughs> help him out. But, you know, here's the thing. Look. I, I, you guys are probably thinking that's disgusting. It, look, in my mind, it is not disgusting. <laughs> and let me tell you why. Watch. This guy mentally is still a 32-year-old guy. Do you understand? So it was like he was in so much of a better mood. Because mentally, he was now, okay, I'm all right. Even though he couldn't feel it, he, mentally he felt better. But the female nurses wouldn't do that for him. I'm like, Wow, right? You got to be a guy to understand that. <laughs> what? What? That ain't rude. That's just you know. That's a fact. Tell me you got that. Yeah. All right. And you know, you guys know from anatomy, from general, right? That the uterus kind of flops on top of the bladder, so that when a woman's pregnant, as egg bird starts growing, it pushes pressure on the bladder. They, that's why they got that micro bladder as a result, right? And if, the, if a woman has enough kids and as they get older, they get what's called stress incontinence because there's pressure on both the um, 
uh, internal and external sphincter, and that weakens. So what happens is they'll get stress incontinence, they'll sneeze or they'll cough, and then they'll, they'll piddle a little bit. <laughs> got this one lady at work, she's got a, she goes, Tim, you know, if I cough or sneeze, I, I get that. And I go, do you have like Depends? She goes, yeah, but I, you know, I don't want to wear those. You know, I'm 38 years old. I'm like, okay. So what they do is they actually have a, they have a ring that they can put in there to tighten up that, uh, that uh, sphincter a little bit. Yeah, that's... The, yeah, there ain't nothing good about getting old, man. Mm. Really? There really isn't. Retirement? Well, yeah, but then you're all broken down. Can't see, can't do anything. Might as well just die. Yeah, that's awful. You know what? It's like the, you know what life should be like the 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 life of Benjamin Button, where you're born old. Right? And then when you're 20, you're still like all jacked up, and then you gotta work, and then when you, right, you retire and you're young, you can enjoy your life. No, you ain't buying that one either, huh? Okay. All right, so that's a real quick overview of the um, urinary system. Say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. So. There's a question about the functions of the kidney. I'm telling you right now, that question's going to be on there, right? Okay. Did I tell you that? Yes. It's going to be on there. People at Timo, hey, you never put the easy ones on there. Yeah, well, hard cheese. Oh, son of a... Oh, look. All right, that's good enough. Here we go. Ready? Watch. What are the byproducts for glucose and fat metabolism? I'm waiting. Carbon dioxide. Hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions. Hypo no, byproducts. That's just the result. Uh, I'll just tell you. Yeah, heat. Tell me you got that. Okay. What byproduct of metabolism do you have to get rid of? CO2. CO2. And what system controls carbon dioxide? We just got done covering it. There you go. So this is for both glucose and fat. Glucose and fat metabolism. I want this. Now, for amino acids, it's different. Say yes. Where do amino acids go? They go to the liver. And when amino acids are, and we don't store a lot of amino acids, that's why you have to have a certain amount of protein in your diet every day. Amino acids carry that amino group. You got me? And in the liver, that amino group is hacked off and converted. What's this? Ammonia. Right, because it said ammonia right next to it. And then the ammonia is converted to urea. Say yeah. yeah. And urea gets dumped into the blood and you have to filter that out. So it becomes what? Blood, urea, nitrogen. Now know this. Blood, urea, nitrogen is actually three compounds. It's mostly urea. There's also a small amount of ammonia. And there is a small amount of... No, I forgot. I just forgot. It's a first. I don't know what the hell. Urea, ammonia, and. All right, we'll just leave it at two right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll come back. So, um, urea and um, ammonia. Now, if you recall, ammonia is toxic. Ammonia can cross the blood brain barrier. Are you following me? So if ammonia can cross the blood brain barrier and you can go into the it can go into brain cells, what happens to the osmolarity within the brain? It goes up. And water is always permeable, so water will move from the blood into the brain cells and the brain will swell. That's why people in liver failure develop hepatic encephalopathy. They get brain damage because of the buildup 
of ammonia. Say yeah. So the kidneys have to get rid of this blood urea nitrogen. And the only way that you can get rid of it is by filtering it out of your blood. And the kidneys do that. Say yeah. Okay. I want this whole thing. Yep. I want that. The other waste product that the kidney has to get rid of is creatinine. We learned, and I will never forget it, it was a Tuesday, that muscle cells store about 10 seconds of ATP in the form of creatine phosphate. Say yeah. yeah. So when the cells, uh, muscle cells need ATP, they get that third phosphate from the creatine phosphate and they slap it onto ADP to make ATP. When creatine is metabolized, it's metabolized to the waste product, creatinine. So the two big waste products that the kidneys have to get rid of are blood urea nitrogen and creatinine. You can't breathe that stuff out, so it has to be filtered out of the blood. That's why on a lab sheet, you will look at blood urea nitrogen and creatinine, and those are indicators of kidney function. What's the gold standard? Creatinine. Creatinine is the gold standard because muscle mass doesn't change that much. So the amount of creatinine that you produce each day is pretty stable. Blood urea nitrogen is different. Blood urea nitrogen is, can be increased or decreased based on how much protein you eat. So if you eat a lot of protein, your blood urea nitrogen will go up. If you don't, it'll go down. Say yes. yes. Okay, watch a little clinical piece here. So if you're in liver failure, do you want that person eating a lot of protein? No. No. If a person is in kidney failure, do you want them eating a lot of protein? No. That's why both conditions are on a low protein diet. Their protein intake is restricted. Say yes. That make, now that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Oh, the other waste product, I remembered it, is uric acid. Okay, watch. Ready? What's this? What are these? These are the nucleic acids. These guys are in the class called purines. Anybody got a dime? No, I won't fit. I'll forget it. I don't need it. I use this. more dense and it's insoluble, right? It won't dissolve in the plasma. Where do you get adenine and guanine from? DNA. DNA. Do you eat DNA? No. Do you eat, you were just chewing on some DNA. Do you eat DNA? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, you do. If you eat amino meat, you're eating the nucleus of the amino meat, and it contains DNA. Say yes. Here we go. Better get this. I'll give you a dime back, I swear. Watch. When you eat DNA, those nucleic acids get digested, and they get absorbed into the blood. Those nucleic acids go to the liver. 
the purines get broken down to uric acid. Uric acid is insoluble in the blood. Who's with me? It will form uric acid crystals. What's the most dependent part of your body? Dependent on gravity. What's the most dependent part of your body? What? No. Oh. What's the lowest part of your body? Your feet. What's the lowest part of your feet? Toes. What's the lowest part of your toes? Unless you have Flintstone feet where all your toes are the same length, it's your big toe. So uric acid falls out of the blood and it precipitates in the most dependent part of the body. And those uric acid crystals start building up in your big toe tissue and you get gout. Say yes. So who gets gout? People who eat a lot of meat and beer is made from yeast and yeast contains DNA. So that's why guys would go to the bar and have a couple old Milwaukee's and then they wanted steak and potatoes for dinner. Those are the guys who ended up getting gout. Say yeah. That's the other one. That needs to be included in your answer as a waste product. Say, yeah. So I went to the doctor and he goes, Tim, your uric acid level is elevated. I said, don't worry about it. It'll be down next time. So I just cut out all meat in my diet so I could drink beer. <laughs> Say, yeah. Tell me you're following this, guys. Okay. So those are the three um, waste products, the nitrogen waste products, and then you got to get rid of creatinine. Say yes. Okay. The other thing that the kidney does, huge function of the kidney, is that it maintains long-term pH. I'll explain that when we get to the nephron. The other thing it does is it maintains fluid and electrolyte balance. So if your kidneys are failing, can a person drink as much water as they want? No. no. And, be, and listen up. When you have to actively secrete something by the kidney, it requires energy. So the first functions of an organ to fail are the ones that are energy dependent. And what are the three things that you have to secrete in the kidney? Potassium, hydrogen ions, and creatinine. So these people develop acidosis and hyperkalemia as a result of kidney failure. That's why they have to have diets that are also low in potassium too. Say, yeah. Okay. All right. The other function of the kidney is to activate wonder twin powers. <laughs> it activates vitamin D. What do you need vitamin D for? To absorb calcium from the gut. Without vitamin D, you can't absorb calcium from the gut, and you get rubbery bones called rickets. Do you want rickets? No, you want to go to Gateway. Say yeah. Where you make, the, you begin the synthesis of vitamin D is in the skin. So ultraviolet light exposure, you produce a chemical called cholecalciferol. That cholecalciferol goes to the liver and is converted into one cholecalciferol. Then it goes to the kidney and gets activated into the active form of vitamin D, which is 125 dihydroxy 
Coley Calcifero <laughs> for the crowd. What? All you need to know is that it activates vitamin D. Do you got me? And what do you need vitamin D for? To absorb calcium. Now watch, vitamin D has also been implicated in depression. That's why they come out with those ultraviolet, like sunlights that you're supposed to sit. And people who live in dark places like we do all the time, that's why we're depressed and cranky. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> yeah. Okay. What's another function? Come on, help me. Oh, yeah. So the kidneys maintain long-term blood pressure. You better write this down. Better not pout. And how they maintain long-term blood pressure is through several mechanisms. Number one, it's a simple mechanism that we talked about called pressure diuresis. And it's also due to the effects of hormones affecting the kidney and there are several hormones that affect the kidney and we'll talk about them number one is a d h anti-diuretic hormone and the other one let me erase this is aldosterone and we kind of talked on that a little bit right those are the two hormones that dramatically affect urine output. There's another hormone too. It's called atrial naturetic naturetic peptide. Peptide. What does naturesis mean? Come on, for five extra credit points in life. You'll get five extra credit points for life. That's right. You get five, Dana, five extra credit points for life. I really don't know what that means, but you got it. Right. So atrial naturetic fact, uh, factor is involved in, what does diuretic mean? I'm waiting. You get a swig off my sparkling water. Guys? Cal what? It's to get rid of water. What does naturetic mean, or naturesis, to get rid of? And what will follow sodium by osmosis? Water. Water. So AMP, atrial naturetic peptide, is the only hormone in the body that lowers your blood pressure. Everything else raises it. Okay, the other thing that the kidney does is it monitors oxygen saturation of the blood. It monitors O2 saturation. And if the oxygen saturation of the blood begins to drop, the kidney interprets that is that you don't have enough red blood cells. And the kidney releases a hormone called what? Urethro, erythro. You know, I'm telling people how to say words. <laughs> Erythropoietin. Erith means red. Poietin means not eating well. How you eating? Poietin. I hate me too. Uh, Poet means to form. So it is a hormone that forms, stimulates the bone marrow to make more red blood cells. Say so, yeah. Okay. Did I cover all the functions? Yeah. Those are the functions of the kidney. Tell me you got that. That's going to be on there. You better tell me about them. Because I did. We're going to spend some time on those hormones. I know you love hormones. 
Some people were actually begging me to stack the deck to make sure that that hormone question was more likely to be picked on the midterm. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Time to do a little math here, people. Ready? Uh-oh. Hormones and math. It don't get any worse than that. <laughs> What's normal cardiac output? It's 5,000 cc's per minute. You got me? When a humanoid is at rest, 20% of cardiac output is going to the kidneys, both of them. So how much blood is being filtered by the kidneys each minute? What's 20% of five? Tell, you can do this. Well, get out that pocket calculator. Let's do this. 20% is 0.2. That's a thousand cc's. Are you, I'll write this down. So every minute, every minute, the kidneys are filtering one liter of plasma. How many minutes are there in an hour? I'm writing that down. So every hour, the kidney filters 60 liters of plasma per hour. You got me? How many hours are there in a day? On Tuesdays and Thursdays, it feels like 72. So that comes out to, watch, 1,440 liters of plasma per day. Do you pee 1,440 liters of urine a day? No. No, you don't. If you did, you could fill up a, several Mr. Turdy pools. Come on, kids. 98.6. <laughs> that reminds me I had a, I used to teach pharmacology for the medical assistant program and one student wanted to give grandpa 1100 liters of Valium <laughs> <laughs> 1100 liters of Valium okay grandpa we're going to get you a little flotation device we got the Valium pool and you just keep sucking on it <laughs> Lord. Okay. Watch. Better write this down. How many people? You know what I did this morning? No. I cleaned. I cleaned my kid's bathroom. Otherwise, the uh, public health department came in and said they were going to condemn it. Yeah, he is spoiled. Yeah, he's a punk. I want to make sure he hears this tape, too. <laughs> okay. So when you clean a closet, what do you do to clean the closet? You take everything out, right? Then you clean it up, and then you decide what you're going to put back in. Say yes, right? So if you know your skis are going to go back in that closet, you don't... Put them in the garage. Are you following? So watch. When you form urine in the kidney, and we'll get more specific in a minute, you filter all the plasma. All the plasma that's entering the kidney gets filtered. Then as that filtrate so the, you better learn these terms. Filtered plasma 
is called filtrate. You got me? And as that filtrate moves through the kidney, we'll get more specific, about 99% of it gets reabsorbed back into the blood. Now, why is it reabsorbed back into the blood? Because it first got absorbed into the blood from the GI tract. Then it got filtered out of the blood, and then it brought, got brought back into the blood. That's why it's called reabsorption. Say yes. And then stuff that can't be filtered, that has to be actively secreted. Secreted, yeah. And we learned that it's potassium, hydrogen, and creatinine. Now watch. What the final product of urine is, is after you filter the plasma, you reabsorb what you want back into it, and then you actively secrete the stuff that you don't want in the blood into the urine. That what That's leftover stuff is going to be your urine. Say yeah. You got me? How many people are following this? Okay. So here we go. Watch. Better write this down. It is the arterial blood that is filtered of metabolic waste. Why? Arterial blood is under pressure. Say yes. And as that blood enters the kidney through the renal artery, as you can clearly see from this diagram I ripped off from the internet, the renal artery then begins to bifurcate, split into smaller arteries. Say yes. And these arteries begin to form the renal pyramids. The artery outline forms the renal pyramids. Now, as those arteries get smaller and smaller, those arteries terminate. Better write this down. At this small artery right here called the A afferent arterial. The afferent arterial is where the arterial blood is going to enter the functional unit of the kidney. And the functional unit of the kidney is right here, peeps. It's called the nephron. The nephron's the functional unit of the kidney. This is, in fact, where the plasma of the blood is filtered, and you ultimately make urine. Say yes. And you're going to need to explain to me what happens at each part of that little nephron. And then I'm going to explain to you how hormones affect it. Say yes. Okay. Each kidney has anywhere from 1 to 1.5 million of these nephrons. When 70% of your nephrons in both kidneys are jacked up, you need to go on dialysis. Your kidneys no longer effectively filter blood. And how you measure that is by looking at creatinine levels. So as the creatinine level begins to climb, the doctor will say, look, there's nothing we can do. She's going in renal fair or heat, and we got to put you on dialysis. Say yes. Now, we also talked about this too. We talked about the fact that the kidneys can correct any pH disturbance in the body if you live long enough. So one of the things that you'll see if you work in the ICU is you will see people who are in really bad shape. Like they're, they were in shock, right? Because they looked at WebAdvisor. They're, when, when they're in shock, 
blood flow to the vital organs is decreased. So the kidney cannot adequately filter the blood, so the pH gets jacked up. So they will temporarily put these people on dialysis, trying to maintain their pH, fluid levels, and electrolyte levels. Do you follow that? Okay. All right. So for the rest of the time talking about the kidney, we're going to concentrate on the nephron. There's a question, and it's a long one. Say, yeah. I'm going to begin to describe to you what happens in the nephron. Are you with me? This question is going to be on there. One of the things that uh, students struggle with, they struggle with the kidney. They do. They struggle with the kidney. And I don't want you to struggle with it. All right. I'm going to quickly list some things that are in urine. All right. One is water, right? Number two, electrolytes. Is glucose small? Is it? Which is bigger, glucose or a red blood cell? What did I say, which is bigger? Yeah, yeah a red blood cell. <laughs> <laughs> glucose is little. You got me? Glucose gets filtered by the nephron. Should you have glucose in your urine? Why not? If it gets filtered, what does the nephron do? Let's review. It gets reabsorbed. So even though glucose is filtered, if you're not diabetic, 100% of that glucose should get reabsorbed back into the blood. Say yeah. Okay? And I'm just going to tell you this because you're going to need to know this. The renal threshold for glucose reabsorption is 180 milligrams per deciliter. What that means is if your blood sugar ever gets above 180, you will start spilling glucose into your urine. That's why a quick and dirty way to check if somebody's diabetic, peeth in this cupeth, and then they will dip with it, and if there's glucose in it, then you are diabetic. That's how the word, and I told you this, how they got the word uh, diabetes mellitus. Mellitus means sweet tasting urine. So back in the day, they would pee in a cup and the doctor would take a little swig off of it. And you go, hey, this has got a little wang to it. No, nothing there. thought that was good. Anyways, <laughs> tell me you got that. All right. So glucose is in the urine, or should not be in the urine, right? But that's filtered, right, and reabsorbed. Electrolytes, there's going to be uh, vitamins, right? There's going to be urea, and I'll talk more about urea in a minute, right? And some creatinine will be in the urine, but most of it has to be actively secreted. There's reasons why, right? There's also, watch. There's fatty acids in there. And we know that there are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So there's also antibodies floating around. All of this stuff actively gets filtered by the nephron, and most of it gets reabsorbed back into the blood. Say yeah. Okay? All right. Now, this is not the structure of the nephron, what I'm about to go over, just so you know. 
I'm going to give you a basic overview of the structure of the nephron, and then I'm going to be much more specific. Yep. The specificity is what I'm looking for. Okay. Watch. The afferent arterial takes the arterial blood from the renal artery under pressure and brings it into this ball of capillaries. This ball of capillaries is called what? Glomerulus. The glomerulus, right? That's a good word. Anyone willing to change their name to glomerulus? That ain't a bad name. Hey, glomerulus, want to go to the movie? Would you want the name glomerulus? Glom I can't even spell it. Glomerulus. Well, you know how to spell it. Yeah. Have I ever taken off for spelling? No. I should. I have. Have I ever done that? No. Okay. I mean, yeah. Now I'm gonna start. All right. Yeah. Watch. The glomerulus is a one cell thick group of capillaries. They are actually more porous than capillaries. You better write this down. I'll show you in a minute. They have slits in it called fenestrations that make the glomerulus even more porous than a normal capillary. So how I like to think of it is think of the glomerulus as a little spaghetti strainer, right? I made spaghetti over the weekend. Callie, do you like spaghetti? Okay, that's good. So you boil the water, put the spaghetti in there, and when it's cooked, you dump the spaghetti into the sink and the strainer catches the big stuff and lets the water and anything else you put in there go through. Do you follow that? So big stuff should never go through that glomerulus. What's big in your blood? Should you ever be peeing blood? If you are, you see a doctor. Should you be peeing pus? Some days. Right? No. And you should never be peeing egg white either. So red blood cells, white blood cells, and albumin should never be found in the urine. If they are found in the urine, there is something wrong. And the reason they're not found in the urine is they are simply too big to get through those little slits in the glomerulus. Who's following? So watch. This is a simplified version of the glomerulus. You got me? Now watch. The afferent arterial has a larger diameter than the arterial leaving the glomerulus which is the efferent arterial. So here you have a simplified version of the glomerulus. Then you have the afferent arterial. And as you can see, it has a larger diameter. You got me? And then that blood's going to come into the glomerulus. And pressure is going to build up in that glomerulus. And it is going to force water, electrolytes, glucose, vitamins, fatty acids, out of the glomerulus who's with me so far and this is very important surrounding the glomerulus is what captures that filtrate and that is called Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule so think of the Bowman's capsule as the sink the spaghetti strainer as the spaghetti strainer, right? The ball of capillaries. So that stuff, the big stuff in the blood is going to be caught. So red blood cells, white blood cells, and albumin are not going to get through that spaghetti strainer. And anything that is not filtered 
by the glomerulus leaves the glomerulus through the efferent arterial. Who, who's following me so far? And the efferent, this is important. As you can see here, watch it. The efferent arterial then forms a network of capillaries that surround these collecting tubules. I like to refer to it as the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. Tell me you got that. Now watch. The efferent arterial forms its network of capillaries called the paratubular capillaries. This, the paratubular capillaries are where stuff that was in the yellow brick road will get reabsorbed back into the blood. So the paratubular capillaries are heavily involved in reabsorption of that filtrate. Also, also, stuff that could not be adequately filtered by the glomerulus and you need to get rid of it, it will remain in the blood and will circulate in the paratubular capillaries. So the paratubular capillaries are also involved in actively secreting stuff into the filtrate. Who's with me so far? And each specific section of the nephron has a specific function in terms of reabsorbing water, electrolytes, glucose, all this stuff. Are you with me? Now, as you can see, about halfway through the nephron, the blood starts turning venous blood. Do you know why? What? The kidneys demand ATP. The kidneys have a lot of pumps that pump, and they're ATP dependent pumps. So the, eight, the kidneys are very metabolically active tissue, and they require a lot of oxygen. So as you are sending oxygen from the arterial end of this capillary. It's going into the cells of the tubes that make up the nephron because the nephron is metabolically active. Your kidneys don't take a day off. You got me? Now watch. Once the blood is filtered, all of that newly filtered blood leaves the kidney through the renal vein. And then the renal vein connects to the inferior vena cava and it's dumped into the general circulation. You got me? So let's look at this. Watch. The afferent arterial takes the blood, the arterial blood that needs to be filtered into the glomerulus under pressure. What's not filtered by the glomerulus leaves the glomerulus through the efferent arterial. And then the efferent arterial forms a network of capillaries around the collecting tubules. And that is where reabsorption occurs and secretion occurs. Say yes. You're following this. Okay. All right. This is where it's going to get a little bit dicey. And when people are taking the midterm, they still struggle with this concept, so I'm going to go over it again. Ready? First of all, what is osmolarity? It's the ratio of stuff over water. You got me? Now, 
What are the two ways that you can increase osmolarity? You, you could increase stuff and keep the water the same. Say yes. Yep. Or you can keep the stuff the same and do what to the water? Decrease, Decrease the water. That's how you increase osmolarity. Are you with me? Okay. So write this down. The osmolarity of the blood is 300 milliosmoles. Milliosmoles. I spelled milli wrong. Hang on. Milli vanilli. Osmoles. Milliosmoles. All you need to know is that the osmolarity of the blood is 300. Do you understand that? Okay, now watch. This is the important part. Look. You know what I did right there? You know what I did right there? I closed my eyes for a second. And I said to myself, please let me do a good job explaining this. This is critical. You got me. Watch. Most of your nephrons begin in the cortex of the kidney. You got me? And then as you can see, the little tubules, they twist and some of them go deep into the medulla of the kidney. Then they'll come back into the cortex. And then the final tube goes all the way into this renal pelvis or the um, calyx. Are you with me? All right. So where do the vast majority of nephrons begin? Cortex. In the cortex. So. In the cortex of the kidney, there is stuff in water that make up the tissue of the kidney. Are you following me? So the interstitial spaces here, you got me? There's stuff in water floating around them. Tell me you got that. All I want you to understand at least initially, is that as you move from the cortex of the kidney into the medulla of the kidney, the osmolarity progressively goes up. So in the cortex of the kidney, the osmolarity is 300. Are you with me? And as you go deeper and deeper into the medulla of the kidney, you literally, if you've, I could actually show you, as you go deeper and deeper into the kidney, you can literally draw a line as the osmolarity begins to increase. So it will go from 300 to 600 to 900 to 1,200 deep, deep, deep in the medulla of the kidney. So at, now this is important. As you're moving deeper into the medulla of the kidney, the amount of stuff goes up and the amount of water goes down. So if you increase the stuff and decrease the water, the osmolarity goes up. How many people are with me? And what determines, what produces the osmolarity in the kidney 
is urea. Urea is nonpolar, so it can't affect electrolytes, and it is non-toxic, right? It's not toxic to the body at all. That's why you can drink your urine. Now, you can drink your urine. Should you drink your urine? Who's with me? So as you move deeper and deeper into the medulla of the kidney, it becomes more urea, more pee -er, and more saltier. So sodium and urea really cause the osmolarity within the kidney from the cortex into the medulla to increase a lot. Now this is important when you're reabsorbing stuff. Okay? All right. And it's also important when you want to make a concentrated urine. Right? So here we go. Okay, remember, when you clean your closet, the stuff that you're going to put back into the blood, whoops, <laughs> back into your bloody closet, back into your closet, are you going to put that stuff in the garage? No. You're going to leave it right next to the closet so you can put it right back in. You got me? All right. So let me do my very best to draw these lines in here, and I'll show you. You got me? So what's the osmolarity of the blood? 300. Then as you move deeper and deeper into the medulla, the osmolarity starts going up. 600, 900, so you're seeing a saltier and saltier environment. And finally, 1,200. Are you with me? Who's following this so far? Okay. So what gets... What gets filtered by the glomerulus? What? What gets filtered by the glomerulus? I cannot hear you. I'm deaf. And the arterial blood. The arterial blood. But what actually gets filtered? The plasma of the blood, right? So did you say plasma? I said the plasma of arterial blood. Kentucky. Yesterday, I got the letter. I'm illegally deaf in Kentucky. I can't go there and hear anything. Right. Are you with me, guys? Is there a video on this? Yeah. Sorry. Do, I don't need to go over this, then, do I? Do you want me to go over it? Who watched the video? You can take a break, then. You can, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, watch. What's filtered by the glomerulus is going to end up in Bowman's capsule, and what is filtered is now going to enter the first part of the nephron called the proximal convoluted tubules. You better get this right. The proximal convoluted tubules is loaded with pumps. And all of these pumps are ATP dependent. So the cells that make up the proximal convoluted tubule are loaded with mitochondria, and they need to make a lot of ATP because these pumps are ATP dependent. And this is important. 70% of the filtrate gets reabsorbed Isoosmotically. In the proximal convoluted tubules. 70% of it. Right? So this is an example of when you're cleaning your closet, you're not going to put the stuff that you're going to put back into the closet 
far away. So the first section of these collecting tubules, the proximal convoluted tubules, convoluted means twisted, bent, yes? 70% of that gets actively reabsorbed back into the blood. That's the glucose, right? The electrolytes, the water, 70% of that stuff gets reabsorbed back into the blood. I'll uh, more detail on that, on that in a little bit. Now, oh, son of a gun. Hang on. Oh, that's nice. Okay, watch. Remember, it's isoosmotic. So the osmolarity within the filtrate is still 300 milliosmoles. Are you with me? Then as you can see, the proximal convoluted tubules begin to thin out and they begin to go deeper and deeper into the medulla of the kidney. This little thin portion right here is called the loop of Henle. Right, the loop of Don Henley. Mm -hmm. Got me? And in the loop of Don Henley, the only thing that can get reabsorbed is what? I'm waiting. What's the only thing that can get reabsorbed? The only thing that can get reabsorbed is water electrolyte solute is impermeable. What are the two ways that you can increase osmolarity? You can increase the stuff or decrease the water. What's the osmolarity of this filtrate going into the proximal convoluted tubules? 300. As you move deeper and deeper into the medulla of the kidney, what's happening to the osmolarity? It's going up. So that filtrate with an osmolarity of 300 is seeing an environment that is saltier and saltier. Who's with me? And water by osmosis will be drawn from the collecting ducts back into the blood via the paratubular capillaries. So as you're, you're not reabsorbing electrolytes, just water. So because you're decreasing the water and keeping the stuff the same, what's happening to the osmolarity? It's going up. So now you got 600, more water gets reabsorbed as it moves down deeper because the osmolarity is going up. And at the bottom, it's 1,200, so a bunch of water is getting reabsorbed. This in the loop of Henley is where you reabsorb a ton of that water. And it makes perfect sense. If you have a filtrate because you took, drank a bunch of water, right? The osmolarity will change a little bit. It'll be actually be lower. So more of that water will get reabsorbed. Are you ready, guys? Now watch. As you move up the ascending limb, water becomes impermeable and the only thing that can get reabsorbed is solute electrolytes so this is where potassium calcium sodium iron chloride all of these electrolytes are being reabsorbed and if you're reabsorbing these electrolytes and the water is impermeable What's happening to the osmolarity? The osmolarity is going down. So as you have this really, really concentrated, what's soon to be urine in the little, ace, little loop here, as you start moving up the ascending limb, the only thing that can get reabsorbed are electrolytes. And it's done so passively, and it's based on a concentration gradient, high to low. Say yeah. Then you get the thickened portion of the ascending limb. The thickened portion of the ascending limb is where you actively pump electrolytes.
back into the blood. So watch. These are the paratubular capillaries, and then this guy is the thickened ascending limb. Ascending limb. Got me? Now watch. In the cells that make up the thickened portion of the ascending limb, you have what's called a sim porter. Sim simultaneous. And there are three seats. There's one for potassium, one for sodium, and two chlorides go on one seat. Why do two chlorides go on one seat? Nice. The law to maintain that law of electron neutrality. Now watch. This sim porter is ATP dependent and it will pump ions, potassium, sodium, and two chloride back into the blood. Are you with me? And there are little little gaps between these cells and when these electrolytes get reabsorbed water will be reabsorbed by osmosis not a lot are you with me so you are pumping tons of electrolytes back into the blood and not much the most of the water is staying so what's happening to the osmolarity in the thickened portion of the ascending limb it is going down so the osmolarity in the thickened portion of the ascending limb is about a hundred so what you have here is soon to be very dilute urine. You got me? And listen up, because this is true. In the absence of hormones, in the absence of hormones, you will always make a dilute urine. Always. So that brings us to the distal convoluted tubules, proximal closest to the origination of an organ or right or structure, distal farther away. So here you have the distal convoluted tubules, and the distal convoluted tubules is where water and electrolytes are reabsorbed and in the distal convoluted tubules it is loaded with our buddy our pal the one and only sodium potassium pump so the sodium potassium pump tons of sodium potassium pumps in the distal convoluted tubules are you with me in the distal convoluted tubules, this is where hormones affect it. And the three hormones that affect the nephron are ADH, aldosterone, and atrial natriuretic peptide. 
And these things are both released for different reasons. And let me state this. If you have insulin in your blood, what should you never see? Glucose. <laughs> you better see glucose. <laughs> what do you see? Uh, what What is it? What? Glucagon. Glucagon, right? So watch. If you have ADH and aldosterone, these increase your blood pressure. ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide, decreases your blood pressure. So when you have high levels of ADH and high levels of aldosterone, that inhibits the release of AMP. When you have high levels of AMP, it inhibits the release of ADH and aldosterone. Right? Body doing stuff that makes sense. Say yeah. How many people followed this? All right. Now, hang on. Once you've gotten, you've activated pumps, the hormones did their thing. Oh, son of a. Hang on. Well, I hope it didn't affect the recording. I think it did. Let's see. No, it's okay. Okay, watch. I'll give you a break then. Just let me just do this. Whatever is left over after the distal convoluted tubules will enter the collecting ducts. The collecting ducts connect many nephrons, the nephron tubules. So many nephrons will dump what is soon to be urine into the collecting ducts. Now this is important. In the absence of hormones, stuff is impermeable to the collecting ducts. So whatever ends up in the collecting ducts in the absence of hormones is going to be urine. You got me? And all the collecting ducts, and you learn this in general, all those collecting ducts form the little ridges in the renal pyramids, and they get dumped into the calyx of the kidney, and then the calyx narrows to the renal pelvis, and then that renal pelvis connects to the ureter, and the ureter is a hollow muscular tube made of smooth muscle, and urine will peristaltically wave into the bladder, and then you tinkle. Tell me <laughs> you're with me, guys. Now watch. Some people, for whatever reason, they dump a lot of urate, oxalate, and citrate into their urine. Ain't that great? Urate, oxalate, and citrate. You got me? And sometimes... Calcium can bind with the urate, the oxalate, or the citrate, and it will form kidney stones. And kidney stones are not like peri boulders. They are like ninja death stars, right? They got pointy little ends. And when those kidney stones are in the renal pelvis, they do not pose a problem. But when those stones try to pass through the ureter, which gets smaller, you got me? They can lodge and stick into the wall of the ureter and you will get pain. 
Now watch. You will get waves of pain called renal colic. And the reason you do that is as the ureter peristaltically waves, it will compress that kidney stone and squeeze that wall, and that will produce pain. And they say, I've never had one, and I don't want one. Anybody here have a kidney stone? That sucks. You had a kidney stone? Yeah. You had one, too? Oh, really? Do you got the blasting, too? Did they check your parathyroid hormone? They did, probably. I would have. Anyways, um, when you come back, go ahead and take a break now. I forgot that video was on there. I shouldn't have went over this. Did it, is it on there? Yeah, but you, talk, on there. you talk about more class than you do on the video. Yeah, and I think in the video, it might be a little differently explained. That's okay. What did I explain differently? Um, the water being absorbed in the... Um, which one was it? Descending oh, this. Instead of the. Thing. Oh, did I? Ascending. You went over that, but not in as much detail. Like, you, you only said that it only. Okay. There's, there's a couple of uh, clinical things I want to explain to you. Number one, you've heard of a loop diuretic? Have you heard of a loop diuretic? There's a loop diuretic called Lasix. You've heard of Lasix? Lasix affects the thickened portion of the ascending limb. So, watch. Right, you got that thickened portion of the ascending limb. Right? Then you got the paratubular capillaries, remember? And then you got those cells that make up the paratubular capillaries, and you got the little symporter, remember this? And then you got potassium, sodium, and two chlorides to maintain the law of electron neutrality. If either one of or any of these electrolytes are not reabsorbed together, none of them are reabsorbed. So Lasix blocks the chloride seed on that symporter. Are you with me? So when you block that seat, you don't reabsorb those electrolytes and you don't reabsorb sodium. So water from the blood, right? Wait, how did I do this? Wait, no. Yeah, water from the blood when it gets in the distal convoluted tubules, that water will get sucked out by osmosis. So you will pee out a ton of water and a ton of sodium and also potassium. So this is why Lasix is not a potassium sparing diuretic. It doesn't spare potassium because all three of these have to be reabsorbed or none of them are reabsorbed. So that's why Lasix is called a loop diuretic. And that's why you have to chase people's potassium all the time if they're on Lasix because you're going to lose that potassium. And remember, potassium blood levels are only 3.5 to 5.5, so Lasix will drop that very, very quickly. Say yes. Okay. All right. What I want to do now is I want to spend some time on the effects of these hormones. Okay. Remember when I told you, I explained to you that the sympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system will innervate the afferent and efferent arterial. The afferent arterial has a larger diameter. Remember, I made that point. It also has a thicker muscular wall than the efferent. So under sympathetic stimulation, right, when you get scared, that's going to cause vasoconstriction of the efferent arterial, right? So you're going to get vasoconstriction, did I say efferent? 
of the afferent arterial. So the afferent arterial is going to get a lot smaller. Where does arterial blood always go? The path of least resistance. So do you want a lot of blood flowing to your kidneys when you're running or fighting for your life? Hold up, dude. I got to take a leak. Then you can kill me. Right? So you want to maintain that blood volume so in case you do start bleeding, you don't bleed to death right away in the head. I just peed off some of my blood volume. You got me? It's also going to dilate the efferent arterial. So the efferent arterial is going to be dilated. The afferent arterial is going to be constricted. So glomerular pressure drops dramatically. Are you with me? All right. Now, watch. I gave you that that little scenario about why does your skin become cold and pale, right, when you start bleeding. Now, I'm, I explained the sympathetic nervous system and the effect of epinephrine, right? Now I'm going to explain how the hormones in the kidney take effect to make sure that you maintain that blood volume to give yourself an opportunity to live. Ready? I want this whole thing, whole thing. One of the ways that the kidney maintains long-term blood pressure is through what's called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. The renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is a group of enzymes and chemicals and hormones that will ultimately raise your blood pressure so its function is to raise your blood pressure and to decrease urine output. You got me? All right. Now, you probably didn't have time, so I'm not even going to make you think of a bad excuse for why you didn't do it. And you probably wouldn't even give me one. You would just say, I just didn't do it. In your book, they talked about the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Did you read about that? Wow. Okay. Well, then I feel bad. Not really. <laughs> Watch. The juxtaglomerular apparatus is really a little sensor that the, the nephron has that allows it to regulate long-term blood pressure. So this is what I really want you to understand. Here is the afferent arterial. And as you know, the afferent arterial is under pressure, correct? Connected to the afferent arterial, these little teal colored cells. These are called juxtaglomerular cells. Juxta means next to, right? So it's next to the glomerulus. And these cells respond to stretch. So watch. Think of the afferent arterial as like a little bicycle tire, right? So if you lose air in your bicycle tire, the afferent arterial will become flat, right? And as it flattens, that those juxtaglomerular cells are connected to the afferent arterial. So as the afferent arterial becomes flattened, it's going to stretch those juxtaglomerular cells. So if there's not enough pressure in your tire, it's going to go flat. If there's not enough pressure in the afferent arterial, it's going to go flat. So when the, there is a drop in blood pressure in the afferent arterial, it will stretch the juxtaglomerular cells. And those juxtaglomerular cells will release into the blood an enzyme called renin. Renin is an enzyme. What do enzymes do? I'll just tell you. They catalyze chemical reactions. Yes, they do, Timmy. More at 10. Are you with me? Floating around in the blood and continually produced by the liver and in its inactive form. The liver produces a chemical that is inactive. It is called angiotensinogen. Anything with gen after it is inactive. 
angiotensinogen is continually produced by the liver and dumped into the blood. The only thing that can activate it into its active form is the enzyme renin, which is also a Fleetwood Mac song. Why was renin released? There was a drop in blood pressure. So what do you think renin is going to do? It's going to raise your blood pressure. And there are two ways that it does it. So when renin um, is in the blood due to low blood pressure, angiotensinogen gets dumped into the blood. And renin converts angiotensinogen into the active form called angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is a mild arterial basal constrictor. You with me? So it will take arteries that were like that. That one's got like a little dent. And it will constrict them. And according to Ohm's flow law, if the artery diameter gets smaller, what happens to resistance to blood flow? It goes up. So your systolic blood pressure has to go up to maintain Q. Now watch. If your systolic blood pressure goes up, right, and it's maintained, angiotensin 1 goes away. It only lives for about 30 minutes. But if that blood pressure doesn't go up, then angiotensin 1 will circulate to the lining of the pulmonary capillaries. And in the lining of the pulmonary capillaries, there's an enzyme called ACE. ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. An angiotensin converting enzyme converts the mild acting angiotensin 1 into the much more powerful angio Tensin 2. And angiotensin 2 does two, two, two things in one. It is a massive arterial vasoconstrictor. So it will constrict arteries all over your body. But its most powerful and long lasting effect is it will stimulate the adrenal cortex. to release aldosterone. Aldosterone in your book is called a mineral corticoid. So it affects sodium and potassium. So here we go. What do you got floating around in your blood? You got angiotensin 2 now, right? What did it do to all your arteries? Constricted them. So resistance to blood flow went up, therefore your systolic blood pressure went up. You have angiotensin 2 receptors, if you can believe it, on the cells of your adrenal cortex and on your systemic arteries. So when angiotensin 2 binds to angiotensin 2 receptors, it is going to cause the release of aldosterone from the cells of the adrenal cortex. Are you with me, guys? You're following this. Yes or no? And aldosterone's effect is on the distal convoluted tubules of the nephron. And embedded in the cells of the distal convoluted tubules of the nephron is a pump called the sodium-potassium pump. 
Are you with me? And it will take, hold up, it will take three, I can't even see that. Let me see my glasses. Anybody see him? Well, I'll do my best. It'll take three sodiums and it will pump them from the distal convoluted tubules into the blood and it will take two potassiums that were in the blood and pump them into the distal convoluted tubules. You got me? And when you pump sodium, what's going to follow by osmosis? Water. So what will happen to your blood volume? What will happen to venous return? What will happen to the stretch? I'm not even going to do it. All I'm going to tell you is you need to do it in your answer. Force of contraction, the whole nine yards. And it is the long-term effect of aldosterone that raises your blood pressure. Say yes. Who's with me? Right? Now, write this down too. The only way to get potassium out of your body is to pump it out. What pumps potassium out of your body? Well, I'll just tell you. I'll circle it. And what stimulates the sodium potassium pump in the distal convoluted tubules? Aldosterone. So watch. Oh, Timmy's relating. Don't be hating. <laughs> in people with Addison's disease, they lack cortisol, aldosterone, say yeah, and DHEA. So will they have aldosterone to stimulate the sodium potassium pump? No. So what's going to happen to the amount of sodium that ends up in their urine? It's going, it going to what? Increase. So what's going to happen to the amount of water they pee out? It's going to go up. That's why they develop polyuria. And they also develop hyperkalemia because they can't get the potassium out because they ain't got no aldosterone. Whee. You guys are uh, you're all having um, midterm letdown. That's what you're having. That's why I think everyone does bad on the respiratory quiz, because they get this midterm letdown. Yeah. No one does good on that. Well, I shouldn't say no one. Very few people do good on that. I don't know why. Certainly isn't a teacher. Say so, yeah. Got me? So it's the long-term effects of aldosterone. that really raise somebody's blood pressure. So what you really want to do is you want to eliminate the effects of aldosterone. So wait, where is it? So there's drugs out there called ACE inhibitors. And ACE inhibitors inhibit angiotensin converting enzyme. And they prevent the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So what don't you get? The massive arterial vasoconstriction, and more importantly, you don't get the release of aldosterone. So it is, and, uh, with an ACE inhibitor, it's a arterial vasodilator, so that will reduce arterial resistance, lowering blood pressure, and it is also, uh, will lower your sodium level by inhibiting the sodium potassium pump. Say so, yeah. So, watch. That's why I couldn't really tell you. Hey, Terry, you're making a lot of noise out there.
That wasn't me. Yeah. It was Athena and Kamani. They were yelling. Yeah. I'll take points off, Terry. You don't worry about it. Okay. Watch. Watch. Do you remember this guy? Congestive heart failure? Do you want to give a person that has congestive heart failure a calcium channel blocker? But you need to dilate their arteries. You need to decrease their afterload. Well, you just learned a drug that dilates arteries, didn't you? That's why they're given ACE inhibitors. And do you want them to have a big blood volume? No. So the inhibiting aldosterone will cause them to pee out the sodium and lower their blood volume too. No one will explain that to you. And I'm just going to explain it to myself very quietly. So when I walk by you guys, I go, I know something you don't. How many uh, people followed that? Okay. That's the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. Can I give you one more clinical thing, or should I just keep going? Keep going? One more clinical thing? You want to hear it? Yeah. Do you know what, uh, you ever hear of uh, these guys? They're called uh, ARBs. Have you heard of ARBs? No? ARBs, write this down. This is an, they're called angiotensin II receptor blockers. Angiotensin II receptor blockers. Hey, yeah. What I should have made to do is watch Joey Bag of Donuts videos on ACE inhibitors. Those are those are legendary. Watch. One of the things that happens when you give people an ACE inhibitor, I'm not going to get into all of it, but when you give them an ACE inhibitor, one of the things they develop is a cough, right? Where's ACE? It's in the lining of the pulmonary capillaries. I'm not going to get into all that. So what they did about 20, 25 years ago, they came up with not ACE inhibitors, but ACE still makes angiotensin II, but to exert its effect, angiotensin II has to bind to angiotensin II receptors. Where do you find the angiotensin II receptors? You're not going to believe this. Anybody got an idea? On the cells that make up your arteries and on the cells of the adrenal cortex, What? what? If you give them an angiotensin II receptor blocker, it will prevent aldosterone from being released and it will prevent arterial vasoconstriction and they won't get the cough. Have you ever heard of Losartan? Heard of that? That's an angiotensin II receptor blocker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Say yes. Okay. That's the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. Want the whole thing. Say yeah. Uh, all right. Watch. There's another hormone that raises your blood pressure. It's called antidiuretic. Hormone or ADH. Now, ADH and the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism, aldosterone, they are released for different reasons, but their sole purpose is to raise your blood pressure. Now, if you look, the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. Aldosterone. You can spell it. Right? 
That raises your blood pressure in two ways. It's a massive arterial vasoconstrictor, right? The renin angiotensin aldosterone, and it increases sodium reabsorption, which increases water, which increases your blood volume, and that will increase blood pressure. You got me? Antidiuretic hormone is different. Antidiuretic hormone only deals with water. Water. That's it. Oops. So watch. Better than the H cell or osmo receptors? Say yes. Okay? Watch. I'm going to relate everything. I'm now going to answer the question about why people have low urine output if they are bleeding. I want this whole thing. Say yeah. Okay? Watch. If you are bleeding your own blood, What's going to happen to your blood volume? It's going to go down. What's going to happen? You're going to explain that again, by the way. I'm not. <coughs> Venus return, stretch, whole nine yards, right? So one of the things that determines, do you under, tell me you got that. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's going to cause a drop in capillary fluid pressure because we learned about a million times that systolic blood pressure dictates capillary fluid pressure. I'll never forget it. And as capillary fluid pressure begins to drop, at some point, at some point, interstitial fluid pressure is going to become greater. Can you see that? Interstitial fluid pressure will become greater. And if that's the case, you are going to force fluid from the interstitial space and the cell in an attempt to maintain blood volume. Who's with me? If stuff stays the same, but you're decreasing the water, what happens to osmolarity? That increases, and that will stimulate osmoreceptors and make you thirsty if you're conscious. That's why dude that got shot in the cowboy movie, that's why he got thirsty. Say, so, yeah. What's connected to the h thal? Well, the h thal is connected to the little dingleberry called the pituitary gland. And watch, you better write this down, better not pout. When there is increased osmolarity and osmoreceptors are stimulated, the hypothalamus will begin the synthesis of ADH. Because ADH is produced by the hypothalamus, it's released from what part of the pituitary? I'm waiting. The posterior pituitary. So ADH gets dumped into the blood. Boom. ADH's primary effect is on the collecting ducts of the nephron. The collecting ducts. Here we go. Where is it? Remember I told you I'll never forget it? I explained to you that the collecting ducts are impermeable to water. But under the effects of ADH, ADH will actually stimulate the cells of the collecting ducts and they will insert water channels into the collecting ducts. Those water channels have a name. They're called aquaporins. Probably read that in your book. And what aquaporins do, as the name implies, it will allow water that was normally going to get peed into the toilet 
to get reabsorbed back into the blood. Now, ADH deals with just pure water, pure water. So what's going to happen to your blood volume? It's going to go up. Venus return, I can't even do it. And that's going to try to increase your blood pressure. Now watch. ADH also goes by another name in France, I think. It's called vasopressin. Have you ever heard of vasopressin? The other name for ADH is vasopressin. So as the name implies, vasopressin, ADH, is also a very, very mild arterial vasoconstrictor. Not nearly that of angiotensin II. You got me? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through this. So we understand the effects of ADH, yes? You got me? So ADH is released in response to increased osmolarity sensed by the hypothalamus. You got me? The renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism, that's activated in response to a drop in systolic blood pressure. A loss of blood volume can stimulate the release of both. So when somebody's losing blood, they don't want to be peeing a lot, right? It wouldn't make sense, right? So ADH brings more water back into the blood, and then the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone will bring sodium back into the blood by the stimulation of the sodium potassium pump, which will also bring more water in and the effects of angiotensin II causing that massive arterial vasoconstriction. Say yes. Guys, how many people are with me a little bit? Callie? Yeah? yeah. It's a lot of stuff right here. And watch. It's a lot of stuff, but it's stuff you already know. You got me? So it ain't like mind-blowing. Who's with me? A couple of things. Number one, alcohol. Drinking alcohol inhibits ADH's ability to insert aquaporins in the collecting ducts. What did I tell you? I'll never forget it. The collecting ducts are relatively impermeable to water. You got me? So if ADH is inhibited, they can't insert those aquaporins. So you can't reabsorb that water. That's why when you go out and have a little tussle with the bottle, you have some daddy pops there, Brian. You drink daddy pops, Brian? Just so you know, for the record, she's shaking her head very aggressively in the affirmative. <laughs> I didn't give you your last name, Kate. So watch. That's why when you go out, the first time you take a leak, there's some yellow to it, but your subsequent leaks are clear because alcohol inhibits ADH's ability to insert those aquaporins. That's why when you wake up in the middle, of, you know, the next day, you're like cotton mouth, you're right? Because you are massively dehydrated. Tell me you got, that's why you should drink plenty of water before you go to bed. You guys ever had that dream where you, you're dreaming like you're drinking water and you can't get enough to drink? You ever had that dream? No. Uh, I just heard about it. <laughs> Tell me you got that. Guys? Did you? Okay. You guys don't seem like in the story mood. Do you want to hear a story about this or no? No? You don't. I'm, I'm awake, so yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyways, I don't know, six or seven years ago, 
They'll say right where you're sitting there, guy sat there, good student, right? So he stays after class and he goes, Tim, my brother, he puts in pools for rich people and he's peeing and drinking all the time. And I'm like, is he diabetic? No, he took him to the doctor, his blood sugar's fine. I go, he's got a tumor in his pituitary. He goes, how do you know? I go, Holiday Inn, Technical College? So anyway, I told you this, right? Did I tell you this story? Christmas Eve, 9 o'clock, he calls me. He goes, my dad wants to talk to you. I go, it's Christmas Eve. I'm wrapping my kids Star Wars Lego, which, by the way, are insanely expensive. <laughs> he just wants to talk to you for a minute. He goes, what do you think is wrong with my son? I said, I think he has a tumor of his pituitary. They're usually benign, right? You go up through the nose, snip, snip, and he should be straight, right? Is that expensive? I go, it's Christmas Eve, man. So I basically hang up on him, right? Because I told him what to do. So this guy got into clinical. He already graduated as a nurse, right? He had a white truck, and you pull him up. He goes, Tim, 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 I want to talk to you. This is like six months later. He goes, you were right. He had a tumor of pituitary, and he's straight. Right? You know how I figured that out? You know how I figured it out? I know this stuff. Yeah. So I said to him, what's in it for me? I mean, for real. How about a Lego set for my kid? Or better yet, buy me some clubs. Punk. Christmas Eve. Who does that? Tell me you got that. Guys? So there's two conditions that you deal with uh, ADH. If you ain't got no ADH, no ADH, you got diabetes insipidus. You got me? So what do you do? You let them, let them insipidus water. You replace the water. That's what you do. It's purely water. Tell me you got that. The other one is when you got too much ADH. And that's called SIADH. I hate this name in this condition. Syndrome of inappropriate ADH. <laughs> Sounds like a third grade teacher talking to his parents. Joey did something that was inappropriate. I hate that word. That's too much ADH. So what do they do? They're overloaded on water. Now watch it. Watch. If you reabsorb too much water into the blood, what's going to happen to the osmolarity of the blood? I'm waiting. It's going to go down. So if the, watch. If the osmolarity of the blood drops, and if stuff can't move, what can always move? Where's water going to go in this picture? What? <laughs> I'll give anybody 50 extra credit points if they trip Heather on the way out. <laughs> It is always going to move from low osmolarity to high. So ADH, right, the um, syndrome of inappropriate ADH can lead to brain swelling. How do you treat that? No, they got too much water. Okay, I'm asking you to think to him. You, you, you give them diuretics, make them pee out the water. <laughs> That's what you do. <laughs> Everything is an IV fluid. <laughs> Got a broken leg, give them IV fluid. Hypertonic. <laughs> that was a, I, there's no way you would have known that anyways. Right? 
I just expect too much out of you guys sometimes. <laughs> Tell me you follow that. If someone has diabetes insipidus, besides giving them water, what can you give them? I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a hint. I'm gonna give you a hint. No, it's not diuretics. It's anything but diuretics. They're they're peeing all the time. What do they lack? You know, we have a theme here going. It is <laughs> insulin and IV fluids, right? You got GI upset. Give them insulin and hypertonic fluids. <laughs> Wait, what was the question? I don't know. Somebody has what else diabetic besides giving them diabetes and diabetes. Oh, right. Besides giving them water, when someone has <laughs> diabetes and what can you give them? Wait, somebody said it. Yeah, she said it. What did you say? You give them anti-diuretic hormone. You replace it. What are they lacking? Anti-diuretic what, what should you give them? <laughs> like if they're a diabetic, they're lacking insulin, what do they give them? <laughs> Sometimes it's the easiest answers that are the toughest. How many people follow this. Mm -hmm. Guys, okay, I'm not doing it for you. You're going to do it. Listen up. You're going to put this all together for me when somebody's bleeding. Do you understand that? You're going to put it together for me. Now, when somebody's bleeding their own blood, both ADH and the renin-angiotensin aldosterone mechanism and the sympathetic nervous system are activated. Say yes. And you're going to explain that. You got me? All right, watch. How do you know your blood pressure is high? How do you know your blood volume is high? Yeah, you're right. Okay, that was a bad question. Right, here, I get a, I get a minus 50 for a bad question. All right, watch. How does your body know that your blood pressure is high or your blood volume is high? You turn red? Oh, you could, yeah. Never thought about that. Hang on. I gotta show you. I'll do this and you can go. Guys, ugh. Getting on my central nervous system. Huh? I thought we did well today. I thought we did fine. You guys just sat there. We answered and then you started. Well, you did, yeah, because I'm deaf. You know? Make me feel bad. Talk like an idiot. Feel like Bueller. Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you, man, that's like the, yeah. Would you want to be a teacher? No. No, right? I don't even want to be a teacher. Probably not. I think a lot of people go into teaching because they get the summers off. That's the one reason. Yeah. Yeah, that would be cool. I work during the summer, though, like an idiot. <laughs> My first summer, I didn't work. Boy, that was cool. I was looking at that clock, waiting for noon, man, so I could drink me some daddy pops. You're not an alcoholic if you wait until noon. <laughs> <laughs> I actually drove to Indiana. <laughs> Could beat that clock. <laughs> Tempted to hop on a plane and go to New York. Right. In the morning, here you go. Okay, I'm going to give you a hint because I like you guys. As far as you know. 
That's about 35 uh, yeah. Okay, here's the hint. Here's the hint. That's all you get. Yeah, I forgot the question. I forgot it. Wait, hang on, I got it. How does your body know that you have increased blood volume? You have increased venous return to the right heart. That's right! That's right! That's good! Better write this down. This is a good one. I like this one. You're going to like this one too. This will be the fav your favorite part of this whole class. Actually, no. April 20th yeah. will be your favorite yeah. part. <laughs> Look, I get it. You think you want this class over? Look. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Reggie? All right, watch. When you get increased blood volume, what's the first part of the heart that it goes back to? The right atrium. Inside the right atrium, that's a terrible color. Looks like puke. In, inside the right atrium, you have specialized cells. I spell specialized. I got it. I'm really struggling today. I should cancel my night class. They're a bunch of punks anyways. Ooh, that's recorded. <laughs> you didn't specify which nighttime class. Oh, uh, that's right. Well, well no, I said tonight. Obvious. It's the yeah, only one. I love you guys. I was just joking. Uh, that's that was Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Specialized cells that respond to stretch. What do you do to the right atria when you send more blood back to it? Oh, cut it out. And when they're stretched, you release into the blood atrial natriuretic peptide. Say yes. Atrial natriuretic peptide has its effect. Oh, 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 guess where? It has its effect. I'm waiting. You know, I could not see that sodium potassium pump, and I, I, did, I can see it up there. I did pretty good. That looks like sodium potassium to me. Yeah, listen up. Watch. AMP inhibits the sodium potassium pump in the distal convoluted tubules. If you inhibit the sodium potassium pump in the distal convoluted tubules, what don't you pump back into the blood? Sodium. And if you don't pump the sodium back in, what don't follow? Water. So what happens to the amount of urine that you produce? Decreases. Oh. Decreases. Oh, what? No, it increases because you're not reabsorbing it back into the blood. You're not reabsorbing it back into the blood, so it urine output increases. Say yes. You could, did you follow that? Yes. No, you didn't. You're just saying that so I shut up. <laughs> You're like my kids, right? You got that bit? Oh, yeah, Dad, yeah. <laughs> All right. AMP, Buellers. <laughs> it inhibits the sodium-potassium pump. And if the sodium's here, if it remains in the collecting tubules, you're going to pee it out along with water. Say yeah. yeah yes. how, how many people got that? I feel like you're going to beat us with that. No, I'm not. <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> got to get a mask on. <laughs> <laughs> Did I tell you that I told, uh, I told you this, right? This weirded me out. This really weirded me out. And then I'll let you go. Leave me alone. God. I'm at that nursing curriculum committee meeting, right? They go, well, Tim, what if students get up and they have questions about the test? I go, you don't let them get up, right? <laughs> students in my class, they get up, I throw things at them. One time I had dirty scalpels and I threw them at them. And one nurse is in a chair like this and she rolled back. She goes, you're kidding. 
I go, that's like a Channel 6 Fox exclusive. <laughs> Technical college instructor throws dirty scalpels at students. <laughs> like, come on. Did I tell you that I hate people? That's recorded, so it's real. At least you're equal. Why, because I hate me too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'll knock it off. I'm almost done. Tell me you got this. Guys, yes or no? Okay, so watch, watch. Aldosterone increases your blood volume. AMP decreases your blood volume. Say yes, yeah. right? So when the aldosterone's around, it's going to inhibit AMP, right? And when AMP's around, it's going to inhibit aldosterone. Wouldn't make sense. Okay, last thing, then you can ambulate. Don't hate. How many people here have overstretched left ventricles? <laughs> Anybody? Do you have stretch marks on your ventricles? <laughs> yeah, here we go. Okay, watch. There's a hormone that's released from ventricular cells that are overstretched. It's called B. N P brain naturetic peptide. It was first isolated in sheep's brains. That's why it's called brain naturetic peptide. Are you with me? This is very important. You only get BNP released when your ventricular muscle cells are overstretched. Who has overstretched ventricular muscle cells? People with CHF say yes. So watch. The higher the BNP, the more the ventricle is overstretched. <laughs> Bless you. That was a good one. You're going to get... Looked like you got some kind of neck injury. You did good. You went oh, like that. That's what it almost means. Oh, all right. She's going to come in in a cervical collar. <laughs> okay, here we go. So watch. The higher the BNP, the worse the congestive heart failure. So one of the ways that doctors assess a patient's congestive heart failure status is they will monitor BNP levels. Have you ever seen that in a hospital? You've seen it? Are you just saying that to make me feel good? Oh, yeah. All right. So they came in with shortness of breath, right? And they want to see if it was an exacerbation of their CHF. And if it was, their BMP goes up. Say yes. Yeah. And BMP works just like AMP, only it's got a B. <laughs> you got me? It inhibits the sodium potassium pump, so it's trying to get rid of that extra sodium. But you only get BMP released when you have overstretched ventricular muscle cells. So if you don't have congestive heart failure, are you going to get a lot of BMP released? No. Say yes. Do you know how good that information is? You know, no one will explain that to you. That's a fact. Right? Okay, ambulate. We did good. We're going to finish up on Thursday. We will have the respiratory kidney quiz a week from Thursday. That is what day? The 22nd? The 22nd. There'll be uh, 10 to 12 questions on there. You got me? 10 to 12 questions. I can come at 1 p.m. on that day. Hey, you guys should give Dana, like, uh, buy her a car or something. <laughs> So she emails me to remind me to post those. <laughs>